So our next speaker is Joel Klassen from Facecraft, and he will tell us about uh, near-term quantum simulations for materials. Thank you. Hello, can you all hear me? Um, yeah, uh, thanks to the conference organizers for having me. Uh, my name is Joel, and I'm here today to talk to you about um, a kind of sort of compiler slash algorithm scheme that we've been working on at Phasecraft to try and bring down overheads for material simulation. Um, you can find our paper there, and these are my collaborators. Uh, before I begin, I just want to give uh, a um, brief sort of comment about our company, Facecraft. Uh, you might have noticed our logo in all of your tote bags. Um, so we're, uh, we were founded in 2018 by uh, Toby Cubitt, Ashley Montanaro, and John Morton. Uh, we're based out of uh, London and Bristol. We're a small team, approximately 18 people now, although it might be more. Um, and our general aim is to try and uh, bring down the algorithmic overheads in um, sort of useful applications with the hope that we might be able to reach um, near-term quantum hardware where it's going to be in the next few years. Um, and uh, we're hiring if you're interested in working on, you know, this kind of really sort of daunting and ambitious kind of problem. Um, great, okay, yeah, and here we are uh, all outstanding in our field. Um, <clears throat> right, okay, so uh, at Facecraft, we're really interested in um, material simulation. We think it's important. Um, it has a lot of industrial applications. Sort of the notion here is that um, typically people will try and synthesize a material in a laboratory environment, and um, uh, this is quite costly, um, and it slows down uh, the sort of iteration time on the directed design of materials. And so we think that uh, material simulation is going to be a very useful application for quantum computing, whether it's in the near term or in the far term. Um, and we, we think it's a really good uh, quantum computing application um, uh, because we know that there is a long history in classical numerical, numerical simulation of materials of sort of not necessarily accurately predicting how these materials will uh, perform in a laboratory setting. So just our ability to predict how materials will behave has a long history of sort of not meeting, sort of like not being very, very high standard, or not uh, high standard, but it's like not always uh, getting the right answer. Um, and at the time we started working on this, there were not very many um, sort of uh, resource estimates targeted towards material simulation. Um, and so this paper is one uh, notable exception, which is well worth reading. And, um, but what I'll say is, is that we really wanted to get uh, into the nitty gritty of what exactly the cost estimates would look like for very specific sort of potentially useful uh, materials. Um, so this was the goal of the project. The project was to find some kind of qubit Hamiltonian that would uh, capture the relevant, relevant physics of, uh, of, a, of a fermionic Hamiltonian consisting of sort of uh, quadratic terms and quartic terms. Um, and we would express this Hamiltonian in some classically efficiently computable fermionic basis, right? So we'd find some fermionic basis that we could represent efficiently on a classical device and produce a Hamiltonian in this basis. Um, such that the, the circuit for a single first order Trotter step or VQE layer, which takes this sort of canonical form, um, would be minimized. Um, uh, we, we would minimize the, the circuit depth and the qubit count as, uh, as much as we could get away with. Um, and we'd combine this with some compilation tricks. And it's, no, it's worth noting that sort of the choice at each stage of each of these set of steps has major knock on effects at later points in, in, in the problem, right? Um, and so a really uh, important element is that you have to sort of make these choices in a synergistic way. <clears throat> um, okay, so as a talk overview, uh, I'll first present the results that we found for the compiler that we designed. Um, and then we'll talk, I'll talk about sort of the design strategy for the algorithm. Um, and then I'll do some, introduce some technical ideas related to active spaces and Vanier bases, uh, hybrid fermionic encodings and fermionic swap networks, optimized swap networks and measurement schemes, uh, and then finally, I'll talk about the compiler design and challenges and open questions. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the results in a second, but first I just want to give a, comp a, a brief comparative baseline estimate, something that we can compare against. And so what I'm going to talk about here is just a very naive, out-of-the-box approach, no clever tricks, right? Um, so this might be something that someone might try to be able to simulate a material using sort of naive out-of-the-box methods, right? They would take, 
each atom and take all the occupied chemical orbitals along with the valence orbitals of these atoms. They would represent this Hamiltonian in the block basis, i.e. the basis where the uh, kinetic energy, the, the, the lattice kinetic energy is di diagonalized. Um, uh, they'd, and then we could say, well, we'll be charitable, we'll ignore all the hopping terms and just hold on to the sort of quadratic ter uh, the quartic terms. Um, and then we would represent these fermionic operators using the Jordan-Wigner transform. Um, and then we would choose the better of either executing each term via a standard parity accumulating circuit, sort of these log depth parity accumulating rotations, um, or apply sort of some out of the box fermionic swap never protocol for quartic terms. And here we used a, a method devised by Microsoft, which was patented a while ago. Um, and then we would sort of leverage some symmetries to sort of even reduce these terms further, and then assume that we could parallelize um, M over four quartic terms in an M mode system. Um, and then we take some lattice size of three by three by three or five by five by five, depending on the material, to sort of make an apples to apples comparison to what we were doing. Um, so this isn't necessarily the best thing you could do uh, or, or the smartest thing you could do that was out there, but it was the simplest thing we could compare against for the materials that we were considering. <clears throat> uh, and so this is what we found. Um, so the techniques that we developed uh, were able to dramatically reduce the circuit overheads um, in terms of depth and also in some cases qubit number. Um, and in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to say, for instance, strontium vanadate, which is a material that's often considered for solar cells and batteries, um, where we found that we were able to, for this is for a single trotter layer or a single VQE layer, able to get uh, circuit depths that looked like uh, on the order of about 800, um, and uh, qubit numbers that were on the order of 180, okay? And this is in contrast to sort of this very naive baseline estimate, which had a significantly larger circuit depth. Okay. Um, and one thing I'll point out is that, uh, that for these, these depths, um, these depths are um, tileable in the sense that you can take the, the circuits that are produced for these things and take a material lattice and sort of tile them along the lattice and the circuit depth does not increase, right? So they're, they're independent of circuit size. I see Tom has a question. It's depth for one trotter step for one VQE layer, layer, yes, that's right. So yeah, I mean, obviously you have to do more work, right? Uh, yeah, I see another question. Is it okay that we're asking questions in the middle of the talk? Yeah? I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. It's also worth noting that I, I'll, uh, yeah, so I, I think I understand the question. What, No, that's fine. Um, I'm willing to go to the gauntlet at the end. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about these differences in bands. I, I can talk about them at the end, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what's our design strategy? The di design strategy here uh, is to consider that the greatest contributors to cost are the number of terms in the Hamiltonian, especially coming from the quartic terms, um, and then the poly weight of the individual terms in the Hamiltonian, right? And so the solution is twofold. One is uh, Hilbert space truncation, and the other is localization, right? And so with Hilbert space truncation, um, uh, what we have to do is we have to say, well, okay, we need to truncate the single particle Hilbert space uh, to reduce the fermionic mode count, right? And so if we can reduce the fermionic mode count, then uh, because the number of quartic terms goes to the cube of the number of fermionic modes, we can get a dramatic reduction in the circuit depth. Um, the other side of this is localization. So one of the things that materials have is that they have this electric screening effect wherein the Coulomb interaction is sort of suppressed by the motion of the electrons surrounding um, it, you know, in the system. Uh, and so you should expect that the sort of strongest interactions should be local, um, and that if you choose a basis which sort of represented in real space has a sort of a localized form, that you should expect some of the, 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 the terms, the, the dominant terms to be sort of localized as well. And, um, and in this way, you can expect that the term number should grow with the scale of localization instead of the system size. Um, so classical material simulation tends to leverage this sort of Hilbert space truncation quite a bit, but is less concerned with this kind of localization and minimization of number of terms in the Hamiltonian generally. Um, okay, so how do we do our active space truncation? Um, to reduce the number of fermionic modes, we need to reduce, we need to truncate the single particle Hilbert space, right? The fermionic Hilbert space is an antisymmetric tensor product of single particle Hilbert spaces, and the single particle Hilbert spaces are where you make your gains. 
Uh, and intuitively, we want to throw away the high energy product particles, and we want to throw away sort of the frozen core particles. Those particles are well below the uh, Fermi level. Uh, and so what we leverage here is density functional theory, and we use density functional theory to generate an approximate uh, effective non-interacting single particle Hamiltonian in a modified background potential. potential. This is called the Cohn-Sham Hamiltonian, right? And it's sort of just a mean field approximation in some sense. Um, and then you do this sort of standard move where you'd leverage the translational symmetry to block diagonalize this Hamiltonian, right? And these, these vectors k are sort of the lattice momentum, right? You have some lattice translational symmetry. It's got some conserved quantity. This is the lattice momentum. And then diagonalizing these matrices gives you some band structure. Um, and this band structure is an effective energy landscape for individual single electron, electrons, right? Okay. Um, and, and then what we want to do is we want to um, truncate this single particle Hilbert space by discarding sort of um, isolated uh, high and low energy uh, bands around the Fermi level, right? And this is an extremely heuristic approximation, right? Okay, so this is probably where I'm going to get a lot of feedback. Um, but I think um, that what we, one should bear in mind is that, is that in classical numerical simulation, this is also a method that's leveraged quite commonly as well. Um, and so this choice is heuristic, but ideally what you want to do is you want to identify some set of bands here of which contain sufficient physics to reproduce the sort of effective dynamics of the system within some low temperature regime. Um, and one thing I want to point out is outside of sort of our, um, outside of how it informs our heuristic, how it informs where we make our truncation, we're not going to be inheriting necessarily the limitations of density functional theory, right? Density functional theory sometimes suffers from issues when dealing with sort of highly correlated electron systems. Um, but we're not going to be inheriting those problems because what this is doing is just allowing us to identify a low energy Hilbert space. This is just the basis, right? We're not solving the Hamiltonian yet. We're just identifying an effective low energy basis for single, given this sort of single particle intuition. Um, yeah, so this is an example of how this is done for strontium vanadate. So we identify a band. And there's choices that you can make here, but this is sort of a band we identify because it sort of has some separation and then we sort of simulate within that band. Okay. Um, now, that was in momentum space, right, these band structure. But if we stay in momentum space, we're going to get many interactions over a long range. Um, so, right, because, you know, you might have some low momentum particle interacting with some high momentum particle, right, and so they can be far apart in this momentum space configuration, but you want to sort of localize things. So then we perform an additional Fourier transform back from this active space. This is a unitary transformation, so this is not an approximation, right? We're performing a Fourier transform from this active space over the lattice coordinates back into real space, right? And so there's some freedom in this unitary transformation. Uh, and so we choose a unitary transformation that sort of minimizes the, the spatial extent of our basis vectors. And this is called a maximally localized Vanier uh, function. And so what you end up with is you're expressing a Hamilton, you, you, you sort of integrate over these bases, right? Uh, projected into this active space and you get a new Hamiltonian, right? Um, and, I, you know, I, this is a lot of work to do, right? You need to have, you need to sort of be able to deal with these sort of basis representations and be able to perform these rotations and also sort of try and speed up the integration because the integration can be quite costly. And so I say grunt work here, but actually there's a lot of like serious scientific work to be done that has to be done to get this. Um, uh, and so what you end up with is a kind of multi-band Fermi Hubbard style model, right? You have these kind of lattice sites. Within the lattice sites, you have, you have these, what are equivalent to these bands in momentum space, and uh, these are highly interacting. And then there's uh, sort of strong interactions, there's sort of lots of interactions between lattice sites and between the bands within these lattice sites, but there's a kind of sparsity uh, on the structure of this. And this is an empirical result, right? You actually have to perform these integrations in order to identify that this is indeed the structure, which is, you know, sort of something that one would intuit, but it's not necessarily going to be true, right? Um, right, okay. <clears throat> okay, so now you need to take these Hamiltonians, which are fermionic Hamiltonians, and you need to put them onto a kind of qubit Hamiltonian, right? And sort of the standard way one might want to do this is with a, a Jordan-Wigner transform. Um, and so one of the things about the Jordan-Wigner transform is that it can often map sort of local interactions in the sort of interaction structure of the Hamiltonian in the fermionic picture into long-range interactions along sort of the, the geometry of, of the encoding, uh, of the mapping, right? So the Jordan-Wigner transform has a sort of linear mapping, and if you want to hop along here, you have to sort of perform operations along the, the linear order of the Jordan-Wigner transform. And then, you know, your unitary evolution goes like the log of this polyweight. 
Um, but this, this overhead can sort of be amortized by actively reordering the fermionic modes, right? So you can, you can, uh, you can shuffle, it, actively apply some operation to your quantum computer to re reorder these modes um, in such a way that you can sort of offset the cost of these high weights, right? And this is called a fermionic swap network. Um, and um, and this fermionic, these sort of fermionic swaps that you apply, right? So this is an example of this. You have some long range operation and you apply some fermionic swaps and uh, you end up with a short range operation. And if you intersperse this with many interactions, then, um, then you can end up actually making gains, right? Uh, and these swaps are cheap as long as they respect the sort of geometry of your, your mapping, of your fermionic mapping. Um, and, and what we can, what we sort of argue in the paper, and we can, what we actually proven that we actually proved in the appendix of the paper is that if you have sort of a Hamiltonian with um, hopping terms all to all, right? So you just have hopping terms and everything hops everywhere, right? And you wanna, you wanna perform sort of like a first order Trotter style circuit for that kind of, for that kind of Hamiltonian, then uh, a naive sort of swap network protocol on the jordan Binger transform is sort of the optimal thing you can hope to do in terms of circuit depth. Um, uh, and so, but you know, the benefits of this, this, this um, fermionic swap network kind of diminishes when the long range interactions, these kinds of interactions, right, um, uh, are, are, are few, when there's not as many of them, when there's some kind of sparsity. And so the, the sort of fermionic swap network sort of helps for densely interacting systems, but it hurts for sparsely interacting systems, right? <clears throat> okay, so there's another way of getting around these sort of jordan Wigner strings, and that's by using some, some local fermion to qubit mappings, right? What you do is you sort of introduce a new representation of your, of your fermionic algebra, and I'll talk about this in more detail uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, and so you can introduce some sort of uh, low poly weight representation of, of certain, certain interactions in your Hamiltonian graph, and so you get a kind of new geometry for, for your fermionic mapping. Uh, and so and the cost of, having, of being able to reduce this thing is that you, you introduce some more qubits and you have to, re, you have to project into a code space. Um, but you have some new geometry, and then one thing to note is that if you have operations between distant modes on this geometry, they are, again, inherit this kind of jordan Wigner style string, but it's just, you know, you have choices on what paths you can take, right? And so the thing about this mapping, these mappings is that their efficiency generally goes away when you try to make highly connected local geometry. And so they help for sparsely interacting systems, but they hurt for densely interacting systems. Thanks. I'll try and speed it up. <laughs> um, so the idea here is that we've got this sort of densely connected part and a sparsely connected part. And so what we want to do is we want to leverage both the best of both worlds. So what we do is we sort of take one of these local mappings here. We have the compact encoding. We have like a site here. And we replace this site with a jordan Wigner chain, right? And, uh, and, then we, and, then, and then we say, okay, so we can do swap networks along sort of neighboring jordan Wigner chains, uh, which correspond to interactions between these sites here. And that's how we can sort of leverage this swap network protocol in, um, in and so leverage the swap network protocol for dense interactions and the, and the encoding for sparse interactions. Okay. Um, and then we introduce an additional protocol for sort of leveraging some additional sparsity in the interaction terms, right? We don't have all, to, like, all interaction everywhere, so we can sort of leverage some of that sparsity to, and, and the way we do that is we, we can build a custom swap network, which is a kind of a steepest descent approach. So you say, okay, given my choices of swaps, which ones get me to uh, a configuration which uh, optimizes the number, of, um, the number of terms I can execute in parallel? Um, and this gets a bit more complicated for quartic terms. Okay, so then we have a, then we actually have to build a compiler to be able to figure out what the actual outcome of these sort of heuristic methods are. So we have to synthesize all these heuristic methods, build a full stack compiler which takes something at the beginning, which is an atomic configuration, and at the end spits out this kind of optimized circuit. And this is quite a challenging task. It's highly non-trivial to put all these pieces together. And in particular, and, and um, what we end up with is a compiler that produces a sort of spatially tileable VQE or TDS circuit, um, right? These things fit together in a nice, in a nice tileable way, um, so that the circuit depth is sort of independent of system size. It sort of maximally leverages this sort of local structure of the Hamiltonian, right? And it sort of this goes with your intuition about how a material should perform, right? It's light cone arguments and things like this. Um, and it's impossible. It's important to note that it's impossible to know how the performance of this is going to be without actually building this kind of compiler, right? You have your intuition, but you don't know what's gonna happen. 
Um, and the idea is that we're going to, we plan to use this compiler to sort of iterate on the designs that we've introduced already to try and bring these uh, depths down even further. Um, so I just want to put the results up again. Um, and one thing I'll say is that um, we, we know how to improve these numbers further. And the other thing I'll say is that really I, what I want you to focus on is this work here, right? This isn't meant to say that nobody knew how to do anything better than the baseline estimate before, right? People had smart ideas, but just, I think it's really worth considering just the, even, the, how significant this reduction is, right? Um, so I have some open questions and challenges, but I'm out of time, so maybe you can ask them for me. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your time. <clears throat> thank you very much for the fantastic talk and Thanks. congratulations for the results. Really Thanks. cool. So, we have questions, I guess, right? <clears throat> uh, do you see it? Huh? What's the answer? Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for, for your talk. And Hi. So, uh, okay, uh, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, I couldn't get in your table, uh, when you said that the baseline estimation, I mean, what do you mean exactly here? I mean, is it, how do you get these numbers? Yeah, so this was the, the thing I mentioned at the beginning, the, the comparative baseline estimate. So this is the protocol that one might sort of do out of the box, right? If you, if you didn't want to apply any clever tricks, you just sort of say, what's the thing that, bog standard kind of method might perform, right? So it's, um, it's, it's, it's this slide here. You basically just go, you take your atom, you take it to orbitals, right? You go into the block basis, and then you, and then you represent it in the jordan Bigner transform, and, and then you apply maybe some uh, very simple swap network protocol. I see. And also yeah. there is a uh, recent pro uh, proposal by uh, uh, Michel Lukin and Peter Zoller uh, for fermionic quantum simulators. They basically, that the proposal is that they can make a fermionic quantum simulators, which means that instead of qubits, we will have fermions in, in, in Rydberg atoms. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any you know, guess what the results will be if you use switch, switch entirely to, to the fermionic uh, simulator? Because we, we completely ignore jordan Wigner transformations then. Uh, yeah, well, I, um, that's a good question. I think it would probably be unwise for me to guess, um, but I think, uh, the Jordan Wigner, the, the sort of local encodings, I think probably it contribute maybe 50% of the gains, but it would be hard for me to say with confidence. Yeah. I yeah. see, okay, thank you. Um, so you, there's a, a number of sort of uncontrolled approximations that you're making. So how do you know that your, you know, your improved circuit depths won't just like give you much worse accuracy than your baseline estimate? Yeah, I think that's basis? like the weakest point of this work. I think it's a fair point. Um, I, I don't think I'm making a, we're making a number of uncontrolled approximations. I think there's one really significant approximation, which is the active space truncation. And um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, these kinds of approximations are also used in classical numerical simulation. Um, and so I think we're justified in at least suggesting that this may be an appropriate avenue to take. Um, I think in the end, what we, we sh it's really hard to sort of put concrete sort of guarantees on which approximations are justified and which are not. And I think you're going to need sort of to collaborate with the material science community, and, uh, which is what we are doing here at Facecraft, um, in order to sort of generate uh, the right kinds of insights to be able to understand where these approximations are justified and where they're not, right? And I think it's going to be an iterative process um, in the same way as it was for, for classical numerical simulation of materials. But I, I think it's also an interesting open uh, research question to try and get better sort of guarantees on these approximations. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other question? Martin. Hey, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I'm wondering, uh, like, like today in the morning we heard that there's yeah limited hope for NISC devices. I was Maybe can you this comment on in this direction? Like, like, what what do you think about the uh, quantum computation without error correction? Is there any hope one could uh, get a useful quantum advantage on the material science part? 
Yeah, I think um, this is a this is. I think I'm going to give you like my own personal perspective. Um, I think it's very historically. It's often not been a good strategy to make sort of confident claims about what's possible and what's impossible in the future, right? Typically what we find in the history of the development of technology is that people are often surprised by things. Um, and so I think what compels me to work in this domain and work for Facecraft is that there's a really interesting open scientific question here that's worth investigating and that's what motivates me the most. It's not how confident I am about whether NISC is possible, but rather how little I know about whether NISC is possible that motivates my work, I think. Does that make sense? Or, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna tell you that, I, that we know exactly how to solve the problem of performing quantum advantage in NISC, but what I will say is that, like, I think there's a lot of interesting avenues to explore that haven't been discounted, and it would be a shame for us um, to not pursue them out of fear of failing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any last question? Uh, actually, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, the first one was about uh, you told you ignored the hopping terms in the beginning. Uh, why is that done? Uh, doesn't it sacrifice then the interaction between them? Yeah, maybe I wasn't sufficiently clear. This, this slide here was a comparative baseline estimate. This is what we use to compute uh, the numbers that we're comparing against. And so... Uh, already materials that allow this fermionic swapping are, uh, would they be created artificially? Um, maybe I don't understand your question. Uh, can you rephrase it? Uh, all materials allow this uh, fermionic swapping? Yeah, so um, this protocol, like with these, with these sort of swap protocols, this is all generic. Um, it, it can be applied to sort of any kinds of fermionic Hamiltonian that you like, but um, the gains from it will depend on the details of the material. Um, and so that's why we sort of actually wanted to apply these protocols to specific real, real materials because we wanted to see whether our intuitions actually bore out in sort of <laughs> in like a, a real system, right? And so, so these numbers are for these materials. That we've performed them for these materials. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Thanks. So we thank the speaker again for the fantastic work. Thank you very much.